dancing and singing and telling stories in their myths and it was so similar to American Indians. Even That's the cool. houses they were living in were. And of course there are ancient historical connections between the American Indians and the people who said they were. It's a spectacular location. Inside, or on the outside, especially, there's cover, it's covered with cupules that they were pecked in by Chumash Indians. I grew up with a butterfly net in my hand, basically. A lot of our camping trips and family vacations were in places where we would go collecting and he would hang up um, ultraviolet light at night to attract the moths. For a while as I was growing up thought I was going to become an entomologist. I was going to study insects but uh, later on I discovered archaeology. I was just trying to see if you could get a shot of the mm -hmm. The uh, cave, I mean. Okay. Yeah, see, the cave is right over here. You can see the big uh, okay. uh, exposed sandstone there. We were Boy Scouts. We didn't have a lot of archaeological field experience, although we were being supervised. And it was at a location where there'd been a hotel at one time. So the, the, it was already a disturbed site. So it wasn't too much harm being done by allowing us to do the excavation there. But it, it was full of fish bone and um, sea mammal bone and, and shells. Uh, it was really interesting. And so I converted part of our family garage into a archeology span lab. And I was bagging the bone and and studying it. So that was kind of my first introduction to archaeology. We know that many of the Chumash village sites have boulders like this near them that are covered with cupules so that are pecked into the rock by Chumash Indians. And the whole side of the top of this formation is covered with these cupules. They're uh, ceremonial and we're not sure their exact significance, but they oftentimes are found uh, in association with rock art, with rock paintings. At UCSB, I got a degree in cultural anthropology, but at the time I finished up, I wasn't so sure I wanted to go into anthropology as a profession. I began thinking maybe I wanted to be a teacher or like my parents. I. Uh, tried sales for a while. I was practicing yoga and teaching yoga classes. I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. I saw an advertisement for summer seasonal work in the Forest Service. And so I applied for that and went to work for as a firefighter, stationed up at San Marcos Pass on a tanker crew. And at the end of fire season, uh, they kept me on to do archeological field survey in the Santa Barbara backcountry. I did that for two years. And I really decided, well, this is what I love doing. I, I, archaeology is what I want to do for my career. And so at that point, I decided to go back to graduate school. See, the Forest Service consulted with the, some of the Chumash. And they put in a sign with a Chumash word. Alalkulek, caretaker. Creator gave us sacred places we have not forgot. Not just rocks with paintings, but all that is around here, guardian spirit rocks as well. We strive to protect and pray you respect this place. Says so Chumash elders, Polly Adelina. Uh, this pictograph is oh, here, yeah? okay. but it doesn't, oh, yes. it, this is actually a negative image. It's red on mm -hmm. the sandstone. My doctoral dissertation at UCA Santa Barbara was studying Chumash social organization. When I was in the Forest Service, I got interested in the sites I was visiting, you know, wondering who were the people 
who lived at these places. Mission records recorded the names of these Chumash villages and the people who had lived in them. And so I began doing genealogical work, working my way through the mission records. And I started meeting Chumash Indians, descendants of the people who had lived in these places, uh, one of them being Ernestine de Soto, uh, whose mother was the last Chumash speaker, and other Chumash Indians too, on San Inez Reservation or in Ventura or San Luis Obispo. And I, I worked with these people to help them recover information about their family genealogy. All that kind of came out of the work I was doing for my dissertation research. It's, it's now part of what I do. There's paintings in there. And then there's paintings up over here too. But this is the, uh, this is the kind of the most dominant figure is this guy, whoever he is. To his upper right, you've got it like a, this, this actually occurs in more than one site where you have a kind of a central figure and up to his upper right there's, there's, there's some kind of star-like motif or something. We don't know whether they, that's, might mean something. Now the other thing you'll notice here, see all the lead? People uh -huh. were using this as target practice. Uh -huh. I think most of that happened in the like 60s or so. So you know when there was people coming in here and plinking, you know, plinkers coming in and shooting at bottles and breaking glass, and, which is a shame. Mm -hmm. As I was finishing up work on my dissertation, or I was getting close, I was offered a job to become forest archaeologist of Los Padres National Forest. But at the same time, they were advertising for the curator of anthropology here at the Museum of Natural History. So I worked for the Forest Service as forest archaeologist for about five months, but then the museum hired me with the condition that I complete work on my dissertation before they would make me a full curator. And I've been at the museum ever since. Uh, I was hired in 1986, and so that's 27 years now. So there's all kinds of things that, it, that are exciting associated with my job. One thing that, that I never would have expected was that I'd be doing work at a site called Arlington Springs on Santa Rosa Island. Little did I know this would turn into a multi-year project. The research into DNA uh, was also something I never anticipated getting involved in. I told a, a biological anthropologist uh, professor of mine uh, Phil Walker out at UCSB, I told him of my interest in studying genetics and he got me started. Initially I plucked people's hair and looked at, worked with a molecular anthropologist looking at the, gen, the DNA from hair follicles. And later on it was uh, cheek swabs. Now it's saliva. But anyway, we've over the years now uh, begun to reconstruct the fact that there, there, there's different groups of California Indians that descend from different migrations into California and all of this has come out of this uh, DNA study. One of the things that interests me is to use what are referred to as the four fields of anthropology and see if there's something we can learn from all of those and how there's feedback between those different sub-disciplines. So one of them is the field of linguistics. The genetics tell us that the Chumash Indians are unique. Archaeology shows that there's a long prehistory of Chumash Indians in this area. And ethnography, using the, the records of the missions, the ethnohistoric records, all of these different lines of information can inform us about the ancient presence of Chumash Indians in the Santa Barbara region. I don't think that I'll ever be finished <laughs> in studying the native people of this region. The more you learn, of course, it's a, it's a truism perhaps, but the more you realize how much you, you don't know and how much there, more there is to learn.